The agenda will be uh, Jason Owen Smith starting us out with sort of a state of the Institute address, if you will. <laughs> then we'll have Kevin Bjorn, our technical director, talking about uh, some of the new reports that uh, we've managed to release in the past year. And then I'll talk briefly about communications uh, with a pitch to your uh, sense of duty at the end to join us and help us improve our communications operation. So that will um, hand it off to Jason, our executive director. Thanks for coming again. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. As Dan said, I'm uh, Jason Owen Smith. I'm the executive director of IRIS and uh, with Julia Lane and Bruce Weinberg, uh, one of its co-founders. Uh, very sorry that we can't uh, welcome you all in person to Ann Arbor and uh, share some lunch and have a conversation, but I hope that we can get back to that uh, with our IRIS Summit next year. In the meantime, uh, the goal of this presentation, and I encourage you please to reach out with questions via either QA or the chat feature. Um, Dan will be managing that and funneling those to me. Um, but the goal of this is to give you an overview of what IRIS has been up to for the last year and to give you a sense of kind of how we have uh, emerged from the early phases of the pandemic. And so to that end, because I'm uh, not sure entirely else here, can't see anybody, um, I wanted to start with a very brief reminder of what IRIS is and does uh, for those of you who are not um, you know, deeply familiar with us. At its base, IRIS is an IRB approved data repository housed at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. That is the anchor for a national consortium of research universities who share really rich administrative data about sponsored project expenditures for the purposes of research and reporting to understand, explain, and improve what you might call the public value of academic research in higher education. IRIS emerged out of a long process that began with the recession in 2008 and with a program called Star Metrics that was housed at NIH um, that was designed to help universities to do the necessary reporting on jobs and economic impact that was a component of ERA stimulus funds. That NIH funded project lasted through 2016 when its mandate expired and it stopped working directly with universities. Um, in 2013, a group of institutions in what is now the Big Ten Academic Alliance and what was then the CIC began a pilot project that um, led to some extension of the data and some demonstrations of value for universities based on that pilot work with initial funding from the Alfred P. Sloan and Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundations, IRIS was founded in 2015. Um, IRIS is organized around what we might call a core and node model, to remind you. Our core constituents are our member institutions who share data with us. That data flows to the data repository at the University of Michigan, which is by Kevin Bjorn and his team here at IRIS. In that data infrastructure, we combine and integrate the data with a variety of external data sources, including information on patents, publications, uh, career outcomes from a proprietary source, stepping blocks, vendor data from Bureau Van Dyke's Orbis data set, and a variety of other information, including dissertation information. IRIS is organized so that we have two classes of partners that we work with beyond our members. One is what we call a node. Right now we have two nodes, the Coleridge Initiative, which is headed by um, our node PI, Julia Lane, and Ohio State University, which is headed by our node PI, Bruce Weinberg. Um, nodes access data for the purposes of improving the eventual research data sets and reporting information. We also have what we call a partnership with the US Census Bureau right now. The Census Bureau is our partner and they receive data from us through a secure 
port, the secure portal process we've developed, where the data that are provided by universities are linked to restricted federal information made by the Census Bureau, including the longitudinal employer household dynamics data set, which is a data set based on state unemployment insurance information and allows us to see later career and employment outcomes for people who were paid as employees on research grants and to the longitudinal business database, which is another uh, comprehensive administrative data set maintained by the Census Bureau that allows us to develop information about the economic effects of academic vendor purchases and also about employer characteristics for people who go on to get later jobs. The data that are collated and created at IRIS and in our partnership with the Census Bureau feed a series of privacy protected data products, reports and platforms that flow back to our members um, for their use. And Dan will talk about some of the specific use cases around government relations and communications that we've seen. Kevin later today will provide you with um, some updates on the new reporting we've been working on and some interesting directions. We then de-identify the and create an annual documented research data release that's accessible to research users through a secure virtual data enclave we maintain here at the University of Michigan. And a mirror of that data set is available along with the uh, crosswalk linkages to census data products through the Federal Statistical Research Data Center system, which is maintained by the US Census Bureau, which also uh, certifies access and privacy protection through that thing. And so IRIS as a whole has grown into uh, what we think is a very effective machine for both producing valuable products and developing new knowledge about how academic research has and can have improved positive effects on our society based on a growing interdisciplinary research community. And what I'm interested and excited to tell you about today is some of the new progress that we've made over the last year. As you know, it's been a challenging year. Um, nevertheless, uh, despite our, our, our friend, the coronavirus that is hanging out in the background of this slide, um, we're very pleased to be able to report that a lot of interesting things have been happening. Um, we just made uh, recently our most recent 2020 annual research data release. That data release uh, covers record level information for more than 450,000 sponsored project awards that cover about $99 billion in direct cost spending, pay wages to about 720,000 employees on, the, on participating campuses, and include information about purchases from a vast number of for-profit, non-profit, vendor organizations. The data set that we maintain has been accessed and used for research purposes by more than 250 users from 84 institutions. And one of the things I'll tell you about in a little bit is some of the nifty new research that's very exciting that's being done um, by folks with these secure data that we provide. We also, with help from um, our member institutions and the, the institutions that are represented here today, especially, um, have done some brand new work that has been aimed at attempting to develop better, more up-to-date information about the effects that COVID-19 has had on the academic research portfolio. Um, including uh, some reports I'll tell you about in a second that have been released uh, for recent spending and some new work that we're doing to develop more extensive uh, reporting to help support recovery work that is beginning to go on on all of our campuses. In the same time period, we've released a couple of new data products that Kevin will tell you about, including a thoroughly revised employee report and a new tool, which we call the IRIS Impact Finder, which is designed in collaboration with some of our communications um, professionals at our member institutions in order to aid in uh, mining the data that universities provide for their purposes for communications and government relations. A large part of our work has been emphasized, uh, has emphasized continuing to grow 
the participation and the data set that IRIS is based on, develop new products that can provide valuable insights for individual universities and increasingly for policymakers and other stakeholders at, across the nation who are interested not in a single university's impact, but in understanding and characterizing the impact of the academic research enterprise writ large across the country. We've been matching that with uh, a number of newly funded grants that allow us to expand our support for the research community, including some new training opportunities that have led to new products. We've recently begun, um, and this is being directed out of our Ohio State node by Bruce Weinberg, a brand new research lecture series uh, for work in progress using the data we produce. We're calling that the Umetrics Lunch series. Um, and that has a bunch of interesting things going on. And we've added a few um, other points of contact, particularly around webinars that have been aimed at various constituencies on our campuses to help them better understand and make use of the products we develop. I'm gonna to end today by reminding everyone that IRIS only works because of the participation of and uh, the input from our member institutions and the larger community. And the time has come again to ask those of you who are in a position um, because of your participation in IRIS to take part in this, to nominate representatives to run for some open seats on the IRIS board of directors. And I'll circle back to how that is done at the end, but it's an absolutely essential component of our ability to do the work we do and to be responsive to the needs of the higher education and university community. With that said, um, we're very proud of what we've accomplished this year, and we think we're making uh, really interesting strides, but that didn't uh, come necessarily easily. And so as uh, this is both a business meeting and a state of iris, it's important to recognize that we've made a lot of adjustments over the last year to keep iris working at what we believe is a very high level and um, to keep us able to be responsive, particularly to the emerging data and reporting needs that are associated with COVID-19. And so I won't belabor this, but um, you know, among the things that we've managed to do and that I think have left us in a stronger position now than even we were at the beginning of the pandemic, um, were some reorganization and streamlining of our internal processes, um, uh, we've also, with approval of our current board of directors, developed some temporary mechanisms to lower the cost of participation for universities and um, have continued to develop out our relationships with current members and the participation of new institutions um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. So things are moving in the right direction despite challenging times. And I think we'll be working very hard over the next several months to keep the valuable organizational and operational things that we have learned through COVID-19 in order to keep our mission orientation working well and uh, to return to hopefully the normal state of operations, which could allow us to have this conversation in person in the future. One of the things that we're most proud of um, and that we think does an excellent job of demonstrating precisely why an infrastructure, a data infrastructure like IRIS that is housed at, owned and operated by universities and the research community can be very valuable is some reporting we've done with your all's help on COVID-19. And so this began soon after the beginning of the pandemic in April, when we produced a fact sheet that was broadly used in um, advocacy and outreach around the initial introduction of the RISE Act um, and was uh, used in particular by the co-sponsors of that bill, representatives Upton and DeJet, um, to solicit co-sponsorships and other um, engagement from their colleagues. Uh, by November, 
with uh, input from and a very fast turnaround for which we are immensely grateful of a data submission by 10 of our member universities, we were able to produce four individual institutions and in the aggregate strong estimates of the effects on spending and grant employment of the pandemic um, for higher education. And that too has supported a number of new research initiatives. Uh, in February of this year, we delved more deeply into those data and particularly into an expanded data set that came from our typical annual submission of data from our members that allowed us to discuss um, what we see as potentially the, the, the long, one of the long-term challenges of the pandemic for the academic research enterprise, which is what we're calling the salary gap. The idea that at these universities, uh, timely directives from the Office of Management and Budget in the beginning of the pandemic allowed federal grants to continue to pay salaries, even if work was slowed or stopped. That was essential and protected, as our data suggests, between 98 and 99% of the academic grant funded workforce. But as the pandemic dragged on, what that has meant is that grants that were in fields, such as laboratory science, um, that were working with uh, direct contact with human subjects or doing field research, among other things, face a potential budget shortfall. That shortfall is driven by having paid full salary amounts for a period of six or seven months during the pandemic when work could not continue at its usual pace. And so these data have been very important for helping um, Congress and policymakers and our institutions themselves to understand and talk about the long term needs for additional research relief. And as you see on the right side of the screen, uh, a screenshot of a, uh, a recent email that went out from uh, in, in the context of the RISE Act that included for members of Congress a link to the fact sheet that we described. Um, finally, all of this work together and our ongoing work has allowed us to um, aid in producing some aggregate information uh, that has been uh, getting some broader uh, traction and providing some useful information about three areas of COVID-19 impact on universities. The salary gap that I mentioned, um, the longer and medium term potential effects on the specialized academic research supply chain that spans the entire nation, and also some additional information on what may be the long term effects for non-university employers of slowdowns in research training that happen on grants. And so this line of work is developing with additional support um, and a new grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which will, along with an, an upcoming new data submission from participating universities, allow us to have rich data that spans the first full year of the pandemic. So look for new research and reporting um, and please let us know how we can be helpful with these data in providing you with information that might be of value. As I said, um, this work and what you see here on the right is a snapshot of the, the front page of the salary gap worksheet I mentioned. Um, the Sloan Foundation has uh, supported additional work to expand our ability to do precisely this kind of research and reporting. And we have been working with our member institutions on a, a data submission that will allow us to quickly turn around that information for those institutions and more broadly. And so for those of you who are uh, representatives of participating universities, I want to ask you once again um, to submit data. A data submission in April with the close for once business closes in March will allow us to see information for a full year of the pandemic which um, can allow us very up-to-date reporting possibilities and we hope be used broadly to aid in a strong recovery for the academic research enterprise.
that's not alone among the uh, the work we've been doing. And so I just wanted to give you a sense, um, as many of you know, uh, Iris's business model is based on a mix of contract and sponsored project grants and support from our participating member institutions. The grants that we have been successfully pursuing recently um, give you a sense of the sweep of activities that we are engaged in right now and that we hope will feed back um, into reports and into insights for both our participating universities and other stakeholders. And so without spending a ton of time, uh, some of the more interesting things that are, are in development, we're working closely with a group of computer scientists on some new encryption-based privacy protection tools, which keep us very near what we believe is the technological edge of um, strong privacy protection, an essential component of IRIS's model and of our mission. We've done extensive work uh, with the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics and with our partners at the Coleridge Initiative to pilot linkages um, using de-identified data, hashed data, between the survey of earned doctorates and the U-metrics data set that we produce in order to uh, demonstrate the value and potential benefits of such data linkage for research and reporting focused primarily on doctoral outcomes of a variety of types. That work um, is also continuing under uh, an NSF funded grant joint between University of Michigan and our partner and collaborator, David Feldon at Utah State University, which is matching some survey data of graduating doctoral students with U-metrics data in order to better understand the ways in which differently configured research experiences help students develop hard and soft skills that are valuable for their future career outcomes, both within and outside academia. And then finally, we're in the process now of working uh, with our partners and at NCSES on some interesting possibilities for continued data development to further expand the ways in which U-metrics and data produced by NCSES and other organizations might support a strong and flexible research and reporting infrastructure for science policy that expands and benefits from the work that's been done by our member institutions and by the community that uh, really makes IRIS what it is. In this time, we've also seen uh, an increasing growth in membership. Um, we had a, a rocky period, as most universities uh, did during the early shutdown in the pandemic, but with the support of our board of directors and our uh, current membership efforts, we're now in a position where I think it's becoming more and more clear why and how it is valuable for academic institutions to participate and share data with this. And I'm pleased to be able to welcome a set of new institutions. Um, also to share with you some uh, possibilities for those of you who may be interested in conversations at a university system level of ways to streamline and get um, participation involved from a wider range of campuses engaged in university systems. And what this means is that we anticipate a significant growth in both the reach and the scope of the data we'll be producing over the next year, uh, which will come to represent a approaching 50% of academic R&D spending on more than 100 participating campuses. So things are good. I think, in terms of the work we've managed to do and in terms of the health and growth of the IRIS uh, member and research and technical communities, which you'll hear a little bit more about from Dan and Kevin. Along the way, we've been working very, very hard, um, and I want to remind those of you who are representatives of our member institutions that as part of your participation, researchers affiliated with your institutions have the ability to access data through our virtual data enclave and our research support services for free. So when you see in the next slide some of the very cool research that's being done around the country with these data, uh, please 
reach out to us so that we can help you get the word out to your researchers and further expand the community of people who are doing excellent work with these data. As I mentioned, the research lecture series uh, began this week and is going to proceed weekly for the next six weeks and then probably shift to a monthly process. Um, it's going very well. Uh, we had a really lovely session last week to kick us off. Uh, we also have put together a webinar series that's been well attended that both has components that focus on specific aspects of the IRIS mission, what we call the under the hood with IRIS uh, details, and also in broader work to think about how we can help and support the communities that use IRIS data and data products in their own work. And this is focused largely on government relations and communications right now, but there are other things in the works. So we encourage you please to keep an eye out. As we said, we're working closely with the Coleridge Initiative and with NCSES um, around preliminary data linkage and developing and offering training classes that are developed with the Coleridge Initiative's uh, really strong training platform in place to aid in the development of products that are of value and also to expand the community of research users who can benefit from these data. And with support from NSF, uh, from the Education and Human Resources Directorate, we've uh, managed in June of 2020 with a, a kind of crash stop to turn what had been a week long in-person workshop to develop research capacity in education and social science fields into a very successful virtual workshop. We're doing that again this year and uh, the application process is just about to close, but we're receiving a really wide range of rich applications um, and are really looking forward to expanding this work uh, so that we can get more people uh, trained up and prepared to responsibly make use of these kinds of data. This is too much to go through, but I encourage you to, to, to look at it. This is the organization of the research lecture series, the Umetrics Lunch series that Bruce Weinberg has been shepherding for us. And what we see here is a really wide range of uh, research, both in terms of institutions where the research is happening and in terms of topics, which range from credit attribution to COVID-19 effects to the distinctive role that HBCUs play in some fields of science, work on technology transfer, work on peer effects and particularly mentorship effects and uh, increasingly a wide range of research that is expanding our ability to speak to the needs and processes of graduate training in STEM and related fields. And so we're very, very pleased both with the, uh, the range of the topics and with the quality of the research. And once again, would like to encourage you uh, to you know, reach out to us if we can be helpful in getting the word out. Uh, the primary goal of IRIS in its role as a data repository is to support the strongest and most diverse range of research that can be done with these data responsibly in order to enable us all to really much better understand and explain the work that is done on our campuses and across the academic research enterprise, but also to translate those often very cutting edge findings into actionable information and intelligence for universities and other stakeholders. And so the thing that I am uh, honestly saddest about losing in being able only to do this conversation with you virtually this year is that when we are, doing this in the context of our IRIS summit meetings, and we look forward to, I hope, seeing many of you at our next one. We organize that around three tracks, which bring together the technical and data analyst community that is working with Kevin and his team to develop and maintain and protect the data resources that IRIS works with, what we are calling, um, or had been calling our policy and outreach community and Dan will be speaking a bit more about that. That's the community of users 
of the data products that IRIS produces, and also with our research community. And so to the extent that uh, we've had to sacrifice in order to avoid having everyone have 10 hours on Zoom and to make sure that we uh, get the core information to you, we haven't been able in this setting to see as much crosstalk across those three really essential communities as we'd like, but we're excited to get back to it. Um, the last thing there's I'll a, say, and then I can oh, a sorry. quick question. Yes. Um, how does one learn about future research lectures? Um, the, sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, I am, we are, we are happy to send it out. I'm Dan, I'm not sure where we'd publicize that, but we are, uh, we can, can make it more, uh, more available to you right now. These are happening on Monday afternoons from one to two. Uh, which is why it's the lunch series. And so we'll get some information about those out to everyone. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say before I wrap it up and take any final questions is, uh, you know, please, uh, I want to encourage you, uh, those of you that are uh, representatives of IRIS member institutions, IRIS is governed by a board of directors the majority of whose members are elected representatives of the universities that participate in and share data with IRIS. Our work can only be done transparently and effectively and responsibly with strong governance and particularly with the universities that are our key constituents representing the strongest voice in that governance. And so the time has come uh, for member institutions to nominate uh, potential board of directors members. We will hold an election, but we have four open positions, two of them two year and two of them three year this year. And that group of elect elected representatives uh, will be identifying what we call at large board of directors members who can bring expertise from other areas than academia or from other parts of academia. And so uh, this is, as I said, an essential component of work for us. One of the key ways that we maintain uh, tight connections and responsiveness to our participating universities and to the higher education community and an essential route for our university participants and others to help us ensure that we are being as strongly responsive to the needs of those communities with our data products and activities as possible. So, I can't stress enough how important this is, and I want to encourage you all, please, to reach out to myself and Nancy Calvin Naylor. Nancy, if you'll give a wave. Uh, Nancy is our managing director, for those who don't know, and is shepherding this process. Uh, but we're very excited to be able to both thank the members of our directors who are rotating off of their terms of service and to welcome new representatives to help us do our work more effectively. So. That's the broad overview. Um, I'm very pleased with where we are and I want to take this moment publicly and, and very explicitly to thank the IRIS staff for what has been an amazing year of work and a very effective year of work in very trying times. And to thank those of you in our audience and among our various communities for all of the support and for the continuing work that you do with and for IRIS to help make this platform and this infrastructure a very strong and successful component of, we think, many important questions and conversations that span practicalities, policy, research, and a variety of other communities. So. Thank you very much. We could not have done this without you and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, at the risk of, uh, of, of being a little too facetious, I would say that um, despite the challenges of the past year, uh, with your support and with the work of the exceptional team here at Michigan and across our partners, and uh, collaborating organizations, IRIS is in a very strong position to continue its work and to continue expanding. And we very much look forward to hearing from you about how we can do that work more effectively and the ways in which our various initiatives can aid in helping you meet your needs. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen here and
Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Bjorn. Thanks, Jason. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is share with you some of the accomplishments, um, technical accomplishments that IRIS has achieved over the past year and then share with you some of the new things that'll be coming. We have some mock-ups of new reports and pilot projects that we're working on and then talk a little bit about some of the uh, updates that'll be coming down the road. So what I wanna do first is before I even jump into any of that, I just wanna say I really miss our in-person summit. Um, and so this, this fills that gap, but I really look forward to next year when hopefully all of us can convene in Ann Arbor here and get to know each other and laugh together and listen to all kinds of presentations across a variety of different topics and uh, really get to know each other. So hopefully next year we'll all be in person, but for this year, here we are in the virtual environment that we've all had to get used to over the past year. So um, what I wanna say also is Iris from a technical perspective was able to accomplish quite a bit in the last year. And when you frame that in the context of the pandemic, I mean, I'm sure we all went through this. So the pandemic starts, universities shut down. We all have to figure out how to work virtually, remotely from home. How are we gonna maintain the same level of productivity that we were maintaining while we were on campus, while we were working in the office? And you know, the game plans in place were, were very short term. We're going into a year now that we've been doing this, and I'm very proud of the effectiveness of all of the IRIS technical staff um, that I work with that was able to be responsive to our members, build new products, build a variety of ad hoc reports. Um, Jason showed some of them earlier. Um, and, and all with the uncertainty of day-to-day -day life. I mean, the world seemed like it was burning down around us while we're trying to work. And so kudos to everybody that, that had to work in this environment. And it's not just Iris, I'm sure all of you experienced the exact same things. So with that said, there was two big reports that Iris put together and produced and turned out during the pandemic. Uh, the first one is actually a tool, uh, one of our first tools, and there will be more coming, um, called the Impact Finder. And the Impact Finder was our first attempt to build a tool that allows our member universities to explore their data linked to all the other data sets that Iris pulls in to our, to our enclave um, and use it to identify and tell interesting stories about the research that they're conducting. The other report that we put together is one that I get really excited about. It's our new employee outcomes report, and it's based on data from our newest data vendor, Stepping Blocks, which is an organization based out of Atlanta, Georgia. They maintain and provide outcomes data on American citizens, all of them, all of us, I mean, they have everything. And it's really amazing what we've been able to accomplish in terms of outcomes and information related to researchers who have been working on research projects on all of our campuses. So I'm gonna show those two products really quick um, just to remind everybody what has been accomplished. And so here's the first one. Now, this is a fully interactive tool that allows you to filter and sort data that's been submitted by your university and identify vendors and geographic locations that have experienced impact due to research spending in their area. We've got interactive maps, we've got lists, you can expand information and learn about the types of research that are taking place there. You can dive into it and learn more information um, about the uh, actual research that's taking place. And you can zoom into the map. You can, you can do all kinds of great stuff. You can search by topic information. You can search by vendor information. You can change year ranges. We really give you a lot of control 
over the data and the visuals that you pull out of here um, to, to try to tell those compelling stories. And we have interesting use cases that have come out of this that have really turned into, some have turned into commercials um, that have been used by marketing teams on campuses to showcase the impact of their research. Um, that's been really fun to see. Um, so this is just one of the tools that we've built. The other one here is the employee outcomes report. So this report allows you to see the outcomes of individuals that have worked on your campus in research. Where have they gone? What are they doing? How much do they earn? All of that information is aggregated together in this report. And you can drill down into different states. You can see how many people are going to different counties. You can see how many people are going into different employment sectors. In the past, um, our employee report was limited to super sectors. So private sector, public sector, things like that. Now we can drill down into finer grain levels of detail. And we can also tell you how much people are earning within these sectors. You can see the various breakdowns in earning. And we can even go further by talking about which companies are employing people and how many people are finding employment in these companies and how much they're earning. And all of this is available in our new employee report. So these reports take a lot of development time. And when you add in the fact that everybody's working from home and everybody's coordinating virtually and we're all trying to understand new tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Slack to, to interact and communicate, um, it's a challenging environment to maintain productivity to be able to turn out these products. So I, I am very proud of, of the IRIS team for being able to do everything that they have accomplished. Um, in addition to these new reports, one of the things that I, I wanted to share with everybody is how far has IRIS come in terms of producing reports for all of our members? And so Nancy was nice enough to save and share with me the original IRIS report. So the very first report that we ever produced for our members, just to sort of showcase how far the development has come in terms of what we've been able to do. So this right here is the very first IRIS report. And so it's a PDF that we produced that included employment destination information, but we were limited to only the state level. And we also had some information about employment in, as I mentioned before, the various super sectors here, private, education, public sector, with some bullet points and highlights. I mean, basically line graphs, employment across job by job titles. So who are these people? Are they postdocs? Are they undergrad? So on and so forth, but limited, always very limited in scope and what we were able to share with you. Um, compare this to the new reports now that we produce and, and it's, you know, it, it's like night and day. It's just a dramatic improvement in our capabilities, both technically um, and then in our ability to provide visuals and interactive tools. Now, one of the things I want to say about these reports is that none of this would be possible without the interaction of our members. So these reports are responsive and they are based on the needs and requirements that our members bring to us. And so in the case of this employment report here, um, we started with a focus group of university members who were very interested in this data and working with them, we developed a variety of metrics that would feed this report um, and we have additional data points that could lead to future metrics that could come out, you know, sometime next year, maybe, um, that we're currently exploring in terms of outcomes. So all the reports that we produce, all the tools that we build um, are responsive to our members. And one of the mechanisms by which our members interact with us and tell us what they want is via a group that we call TAG, uh, the acronym 
and that stands for the Technical Advisory Group, and that's currently made up of members, I believe, of maybe seven different universities. Um, and these individuals have the opportunity to make suggestions for new reports, talk about the way the existing reports work, um, talk about ways that we could improve everything that we produce for them. And most of the time, their recommendations fall into the queue and we start building them as quick as we can. So um, one of the new reports that I'm gonna share with you um, that will be coming out probably in the next couple of months here um, is to meet the needs of government relations officers on our campuses. So IRIS has really been getting more and more involved with government relations and government relations officers across the country. And we already produce a couple reports that they utilize to help tell the, the story and talk about the value of the scientific research being conducted on our campuses. Uh, this is an example of one of them here, the congressional fact sheet. And this breaks down the impact of federal funding in various uh, congressional districts in the home state of whatever university um, you're accessing this from. And you can see all that information. We've designed it so it can be easily printed as a two page PDF and handed out to congressional staffers. Um, this was one of the, the first ones that we built specifically for government relations. Um, it's got a lot of positive reception among our users. And so born from this came a new series of requests to be able to dig in more deeply into the impact of a particular district and be able to share that information with a representative or congressional staffers, people like that. And so that's the next one that's coming here. And let me bring it up. There we go. So this is a mocked up example. And these are fake numbers. These aren't real. Um, of the next report that we're developing for, for government relation purposes. So you will be able to select a particular state and then within that state, select a particular district. And then you will get a PDF that again, we're designing to be easily printable, easy to hand out um, of a variety of data points that are tied directly to the specified district. So in this case, we've identified um, Congressional District 7 in Wisconsin, just as an example. Um, but we're going to be able to tell you information about that district that we were never able to tell you before. So how many businesses in that district are employing former researchers from your university? How many people are finding employment in higher education within that district? How many students are currently attending higher education uh, institutions within that district. Um, and then the number of businesses that are receiving research expenditures. So this would be vendor purchases, um, subcontracts, things like that within that district. We'll be able to talk about the total dollar amounts, how many minority, small or woman owned businesses are being positively impacted by relationships with your university, again, within that district. We'll be able to look at things like um, top vendors within that district, who are, the, who are the companies that are benefiting most from these relationships, what sectors um, in, in, in industry are being impacted, um, information about the types of individuals that are finding employment in that district, how much they're earning, um, as well as specific company information and how many people are finding jobs with specific companies and their earnings, gender breakdowns, um, and then average salaries for the types of employees that, that were at the university and then went on to find employment. So this will be the next one that'll be coming. Um, and this is because of interactions with um, government relations uh, officers at Penn State. Um, I worked with them to build a lot of this. And so when we were done, they, they were receiving their data as um, spreadsheets from us. And we said, well, we have all of this. Why don't we just turn this into a great report for everyone? And so again, it's another example about how IRIS really strives to be responsive to our members. And anything that I develop for one member, I try to think about how can we generalize this and apply it to all of our members so everyone benefits. 
Kevin, there's quick question. Products that come. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. There's a question. Are the breakdowns specific to one university or can you also have long-term data from NIH, NSF, et cetera, sponsored projects? Yeah, so I think we're gonna do both. And so um, initially the, the easy lift is the breakdown by university, but we have the data, we can aggregate together and we can definitely present information broken down by funding agency or, or whatever um, filters you'd want to apply. So that is definitely doable. Okay, so this is just one example of a new product that we're working on. Another new product um, that IRIS is working on is a pilot project with the University of Michigan's Office of Tech Transfer. And they came to us um, looking for a way to summarize and identify um, grants and information um, that lead to marketable patents, um, licensable products, things like that. Um, and then they want to not only identify the, uh, the life cycle of an award when it, when it first starts, the inception of an award, through to the moment that it gets into their hands and they're able to turn that into a, a licensable product, but then they also want to be able to look beyond that and look at the impact of businesses, who's doing the licensing, what kind of revenues are they generating, things like that. Um, and so what we're working on for them is a summary tool that will allow them to see at a glance um, the awards that are being, uh, the awards that are being funded at their university um, and what awards are leading to inventions, how much grant money is coming in, which ones are leading to patents, things like that. And then we allow them to then dig down into that data. And again, we take some of their data, combine it with ours and provide them with a very robust data set to be able to dig down and explore those uh, grants, explore the inventions, the patents, everything else, and have a better understanding of the life cycle of these services and products that they provide. That's the first half of the report that we're going to be building for them. And then the second half will come um, later on this year, where we'll look at the, the full life cycle from the inception of the award all the way through to the companies that are creating these products and profiting and then generating revenue for the university. Um, and this is a pilot, again, with, uh, with an organization within the university. But my expectation here is once we nail down um, all the, the specifics that we can easily translate this to any university that, that wants access to a tool like this. And we've already cut our teeth on something similar when we developed a uh, product for CTSA hubs um, at other universities. That was a pilot project as well. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to this. I think this has some big or some big possibilities here in terms of the impact. Um, not only to this specific um, organization, the Office of Tech Transfer, but to the university in general. So those are two of the new things that are coming. Um, and <coughs> I mentioned TAG. Um, so one of the requests that I have for you is if you're an IRIS member, and to be honest, even if you're not, um, before before uh, University of Kentucky became a member of IRIS, I was already interacting with them, getting feedback from them on the employee report. Um, the individual that I was working with there, uh, Baron Wolf, had a lot of positive ideas um, that we eventually incorporated into that report. I would love to hear from you. Um, you can email me directly or you can email IRIS through our general email. Um, there is definitely room for input from anyone who has ideas um, that want to see new products developed by IRIS. Okay, so that's everything, Dan. Um, I'm Dan Meisler. I'm the communications coordinator here at IRIS, uh, which means that I, um, co I communicate I help communicate with members and also the world at large, whether that's through the media, through government relations, 
um, or any other way that comes up. My goal here is just to give you an overview of what we do in terms of communications and then appeal to your sense of duty to help me improve things. Um, so you may notice that we do an email newsletter. Our, our lists have been growing quite a bit. So we do this about um, once every couple of weeks, maybe once a month. Um, and we get a pretty good um, um, open rate, uh, about 30% which is good for the um, industry and uh, click rate of pretty high, about 6%. Um, our social media following has been increasing as well. We just started a LinkedIn account, um, which has been pretty, uh, I'm pleased with the way it's grown. And we've also started a YouTube channel, uh, which we plan to take advantage of uh, to a more fuller extent as time goes by. We send out emails with each uh, report release. These uh, come out every, at least every month. Um, and with those, I send a press release template. Um, this is meant to make it easy for member universities to highlight the um, aspects of our report that match with their communication priorities at the moment. Um, I certainly don't know in great detail what those are. So the, the template is very general and talks about, you know, overall spending. My hope is that members will take that and tailor it to their particular needs. And we've had some pretty good pickup with that. I'll, I'll show a couple of examples in a minute, uh, but I'm hoping to improve that as well. Another thing we're uh, doing are uh, working on videos. Uh, we're, we've had several uh, very successful webinars over the past year on a variety of topics. Often when we release a new or enhanced report, we'll just do a webinar on that. Um, and we are starting a series called Under the Hood, which is a video, short video in which Kevin and hopefully other members of our staff go in depth into a certain aspect of the operations, whether that's data, development of new reports, um, access to the data set for researchers. And we kind of want to use this to differentiate ourselves from other data providers who may not be as forthcoming about their um, operations or their internal sort of data wrangling as we wanna be. We want you to know what we do. Um, another thing that's been big uh, in the last year as Jason has mentioned was the government relations request that we've received. Um, and I can go into that in more detail later. Um, we are trying to improve our earned media, um, which in marketing parlance means um, media mentions that we don't pay for. Um, so we want people to be able to come to us uh, when they need data on um, the impact of scientific research in higher education. And what this essentially means is media relations, reaching out to reporters um, and editors to let them know what we have. And this is something that um, we need to improve on. I think this is a, a missed opportunity for us at the moment. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is the policy and outreach committee, which, uh, is also sort of functions as a um, communications advisory committee. Um, it's been defunct for a little while and I want to revitalize it. Um, so I want to show you a few examples of universities that have um, used our press release, our, uh, oops, press release template. Um, 
The first is University of Kansas. This was the most recent, and this was a um, press release uh, tied to a, an employee report, I believe. Um, and uh, another example is, uh, was um, a while ago from Northwestern. Uh, it's a very similar thing. We were very excited about this one because uh, it led off Northwestern's entire website for several days. Um, and they mentioned Iris, so that was always good. Uh, Boston University has one as well uh, from a while back. And I'm just showing you these because um, I want to kind of drive home that you can use these for whatever you want, whatever you need to. And then um, eventually our hope is that these press releases turn into media coverage like this. Um, this was a local media outlet that picked up, um, you know, one of, one of the University of Michigan's press releases, which turned into a pretty extensive article. Uh, also including breakdowns by county. Um, so these are the things we wanna do more of. Um, some more examples, um, Jason brought up the government relations and COVID work that we've been doing. This is, um, as a communicator, this is kind of a dream uh, scenario because the data, and products that Iris has matched almost perfectly with the news of the day and what people wanted to know. Um, so Jason described this pretty well. We um, provided data in, in hopefully digestible pieces to members of Congress, to uh, association groups, uh, and, and it got quite a bit of traction. The, my hope is that um, when our communication advisory group is more functional, um, we can find these situations in your state. Like for example, if, if the state legislature in Kansas is, is unsure of the value of higher education and research and plans to pull back their funding, we can help you um, University of Kansas or other members in Kansas um, show that uh, actually there is quite a value. Um, so I will be searching for these types of situations uh, as they relate to member universities in the, in the uh, short term future. The other things we try to leverage are uh, the status of some of the people we know who are media stars. Uh, namely our executive director who by virtue of simply being himself gets quoted in the in media quite a bit. Uh, this past year he was in the Chronicle of Higher Education and a um, couple of podcasts and many other things I believe. So we're always keeping an eye on that and um, trying to leverage that. Um, and this past year we've tried to focus a lot of these communications um, activities on membership development, that is finding, a, attracting and signing up new members. And we've been fairly successful, I would say, in the past year or so, which I, with I think three new members coming on board. So in terms of the future, um, we want to improve basically everything we do. Um, I want to make these press release templates better. Uh, they've been picked up some, but not as much as I would have liked. Uh, I want to um, identify and reach out to reporters who are interested in this type of thing. Um, I've just only scratched the surface of that at the moment. Um, we want to keep increasing our social media following, keep producing videos to uh, engage people with. And as I mentioned, keep uh, 
working on government relations, not only in Washington, D.C., but in your local state capital. Um, one thing, another, I guess the last thing I'm hoping to work on is to raise the awareness of IRIS and specifically our data set, which is free to member universities, to researchers at member universities, among departments with researchers that could benefit uh, from the data. Um, and this would involve essentially announcements in faculty newspapers uh, or faculty publications. Uh, at Michigan, it's called the University Record. Uh, my goal is to understand what that uh, outlet is at all our member universities and send out an announcement maybe every year, maybe more frequently, uh, just to let people know, hey, we have this, it's cool, you can use it. Um, I think this is my last slide and the title is, uh, says it all here. I need your help. Um, the Policy and Outreach Committee has not met um, since right before COVID happened. Um, I am hoping to reconvene it and to kind of refocus it on external communications. So um, if you're interested, if this does not sound like torture, you should email me, uh, dmeisler at humish.edu or uh, put your name in the chat. Uh, the existing members of the um, committee, uh, hopefully you know who you are, will also be contacted again. <clears throat> My plan is for quarterly meetings, but also for an ongoing communication channel so that we can react quickly to news as it comes up. And I don't know if that's gonna be a Slack channel or an email, uh, a group email or what, I'm open to suggestion on that, but I would like to have a back and forth um, with communications minded folks to improve what I'm doing. Uh, and as I said, these are the topics we're gonna to be talking about, um, hopefully working on it. And when I say breaking news, what I mean is when things come up in your state or city, um, think of us and think of the data that we have and how it can help you communicate your um, priorities. And uh, so here's a little more detail on what I'm hoping to do with the committee. Uh, on the left is the, uh, um, the charge uh, from our bylaws. On the right is uh, what I'm hoping to add to that. Um, and I want you, you to help me so um, if you have any sense of duty at all, you should um, harness that and let me know. Um, I promise it'll be painless. And uh, so I believe that's was all I had. And so, like I said, we can open it up to um, questions on any of these issues. Anything I brought up, anything Jason or Kevin brought up and uh, anything we failed to bring up. And uh, I'll just mention we're, we're recording this and we'll post it on our YouTube channel uh, for um, your colleagues who may have missed it. Um, oh, and my daughter starting cello practice, if you can hear that. So I'll mute myself um, and hand it. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, so, you know, you all had uh, what I hope is a, a, a good but high level uh, presentation, series of presentations about what we've been up to and where we're hoping to go. Um, I want to reiterate that we're very pleased with the directions and we hope that you all as key members of our various communities and constituencies are as well. 
I think the major message that I would want you to take from this um, is one, I believe Iris is doing very well and is uh, right now realizing much of the promise that we have seen and hoped for in building this infrastructure with you. I also believe that there are many more interesting and valuable directions to go. And we accomplish that only through collaboration and through understanding better how we can serve the needs of the various groups that we work with and depend on. Because at the end of the day, IRIS is a research organization anchored at a university that is dedicated primarily, if not entirely, to responsibly and effectively using data developed and maintained by academic institutions to do a better job of understanding, explaining, and improving the public value of the work that we do on our campuses, that agencies and state and local governments and nonprofit funders and corporate funders support and extend, and that researchers at all career levels use to make sure that we're not simply redoing and expanding what we already know, though that is, I believe, of great value, but also creating and sustaining a vibrant, if you will, laboratory for translating the best new research findings we can into actionable work, information, and products that can be used in a wide variety of ways and through a wide variety of mechanisms to explain and improve our collective work. And so thanks very much. And one please, one question. questions. We have one. Uh, I'll read it to you. In Scientometrics, if I'm pronouncing that right, and research policy, debate has begun about the reproducibility of research in these areas. In general, I would like to take the opportunity to ask what initiatives, practices, or strategies IRIS is implementing in order to promote the reproducibility of the research carried out with the support of the Institute. And this comes from David Fajardo Ortiz. Great. Thanks, David. That's a, it's a great question. Um, and uh, the answer is we're in process, but there are a number of initiatives that we undertake. First, um, as Kevin suggested, our goal within the bounds of responsible data use and privacy protection is to make all of our work as transparent and accessible as possible. Our standard is academic science and the ideal of, of peer review and as open access to data responsibly as is possible. So we do that in a number of ways. First, uh, we're very concerned with establishing and maintaining the discoverability of the data resources that we produce. And that means everything from uh, very strong uh, documentation and metadata through to the fact that each and every data release um, or our replication data set housed at IRIS is stamped with a DOI that we mint to ensure that it is traceable and findable and that we can reproduce. Within the context of IRIS's virtual data enclave, uh, code and data sharing opportunities uh, anchored on a Git implementation and on an internal secure wiki for research users allow for sharing back and forth of information from research teams with each other for the purposes of replicability. Likewise, the training opportunities that we collaborate with uh, our partners at Coleridge and NCSES on and that we do ourselves include core components of data hygiene, data management, and documentation as we work forward. The goal of IRIS as a data repository is not just 
to make data available, though that is essential if we make it available responsibly, which we do, but also to ensure that the use of that data is cumulative and allows for learning across the many different disciplines, teams, and topics that can touch a general data resource like this. So we continue to do this work. Um, this is part and parcel of some of our partnership and collaboration, for instance, with the Coleridge Institute, which is doing a ton of very important work on these dimensions and on dimensions of data discoverability, uh, for instance. We also uh, are continuing in training and in documentation and in our own practices to allow this information to be as replicable and transparent as it is responsibly possible to do. In some cases, uh, for core tools, for instance, uh, our tools for data cleaning prior to linkage and for encrypted hashing to enable uh, some, some styles of data matching on uh, encrypted strings rather than clear strings um, are being built into or have been built into open source packages for Python or R or other information and our core data disambiguation algorithms, which have been developed by a research professor at IRIS, Jin Suk Kim, with support from the National Science Foundation, are also being packaged in these kinds of replicable uh, and runnable code. At its base, we use a technical set of platforms, Jupyter Notebooks, for almost all of our code for training and internal research and reporting. That's runnable internally documented code that points to stable DOI identified data sets and allows for the easy adaptation and replication of findings by people who have approved access to data through the virtual data enclave. And it's very important to say in answering these, this question that at no time are the data we produce released publicly. They are always protected and secure in an auditable framework that is maintained by Kevin and his team and the enterprise security team here and through our partnership with Census Bureau embedded in the FSRDCs. Um, that is to say that in order to maintain and expand this, we need and seek to build a stable platform that can service a broad community for precisely the purposes of helping to ensure that work done on a general data resource like this one is cumulative and replicable and builds toward a better general and fundamental understanding of the complex role that research and higher education play in our society and in the world. Okay, got another one. Um, there is increasing interest in alternate funding modalities by agencies like people-based grants or ARPAs, not sure what that stands for, and other models. Could IRIS be a tool to help evaluate the merits and drawbacks of these modalities? This is an anonymous question. Great. I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly what an ARPA is either. So if you want to put, put that uh, acronym in chat for me, I'm happy to. Uh, yes. I believe it can. Right now, we are at the phase where the research data can be mined and used for research for these purposes. And so among the kinds of questions that are being asked of those data by groups both internal to the extended IRIS team um, here at Michigan, at Ohio State, at Coleridge and elsewhere, and by researchers who are independently accessing the data through either the FSRDC or the VBP, among the relevant topics are things like um, understanding the effects of uh, what one analysis has called braided funding. So funding from multiple sources that supports a single PI or team. The ability to identify particularly uh, different modalities of funding, whether the distinction between in the federal landscape, for instance, training grants, fellowships, and support for graduate students and trainees that happens through project grants 
or uh, through work that is done with funding from various foundation and corporate sources that follow slightly different to radically different models for how one identifies and funds cutting edge research. Um, there is much work to be done because unlike uh, the architecture of federal funding, which has a strong set of, of unique identifiers and things like CFDA codes, um, the world of non-federal funding is subject to a much wider variation in, for instance, the names of funders. Uh, there are innumerable ways for a university to register that it has received a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, for instance. And so we're not yet at a point where the data are in a position that we are confident releasing reporting about this, but there are active uh, research projects going on. And I believe that the possibilities for more of them doing this, one of the, the most developed efforts that we have been working on was based on a pilot project that Kevin mentioned that started out as a pilot with uh, 10 IRIS member universities that are home to NIH clinical translational science award hubs and that focused on understanding the career and scientific development trajectories of faculty recipients of NIH K awards. We are now working um, both in the research and in the production side to expand that pilot to be better able to look at early career faculty development as a function of various trajectories through different sources and types of funding that include things like Sloan Fellowships or HHMI, as well as K Awards, Young Investigator Awards, and other federal grants. So um, ARPA just stands for Advanced Research Project Agencies like DARPA. OK, uh, yes. Um, change your answer much. That's great. And so uh, that, that I had wondered that the, uh, the DARPA, ARPA, ARPA E model is a very important one. Um, we do have data from most of our participating universities about federal funding from those sources. We have not yet mined them. And one exception is that uh, for obvious reasons, universities do not share data on classified projects if they do classified work. Um, so we can't speak to that side of things, but both the ARPA or DARPA model itself can be viewed here. And um, while our, the data we take from universities does not include all of the details of particular funding agreements, in fact, we don't see contracts at all, um, it is possible to identify different sources and different conditions um, for different styles of funds. And so if that's of interest, uh, I'd encourage you to reach out through our IRIS info line. I'm happy to have a conversation or to work with you through our research support team to think about what a project that uh, attempted to understand some of that using the research data release um, might look like, because I think it's a very compelling question. Great. Are there any other questions or comments? Right. Well, we will stick around for a minute or two. Um, if other questions come up, please, please do reach out to us. And um, please, uh, I feel like we ask many things of you. And I appreciate your willingness to to help us, but particularly if you are interested in deeper engagement and helping us identify and direct the work of IRIS um, for the purposes of your institutions and for higher education generally, please consider a self-nomination or nomination of a colleague to serve on the board of directors, participation in the technical advisory group, or um, the post-COVID revitalization of the communications advisory group. And uh, you know, we will continue to get information out to you through our various channels as quickly as possible and as expeditiously as possible. Uh, Dan and uh, the communications folks here are doing an excellent job of that. But we encourage you, please don't be strangers and uh, let us know how we can be of help as your priorities develop.
and as we continue to work together. Thank you very much uh, for your support through what I think has been a really strong year at IRIS, and we look forward to the next stage of work with you. Have a lovely afternoon.